BookTube. All right, as you know by now, a while ago, Matthew at Maybury Book Club established a kind of friendly challenge. Pick eight books off your shelf and wonder aloud if Steve has read them. Uh, it's a little bit of an even-handed challenge because I've read an enormous amount. I do it for a living, so I don't do I don't do anything else. Uh, and it's been a lot of fun because and I would argue that the books that I haven't read have been more fun than the ones I have because people are forced to go away from the main highway of their libraries, go to the little byways and pick things that might hold a special place in their heart, but that they've never talked about on the channel before. And that's great. That's been absolutely fantastic. And that ran its course. Whole bunch of videos, whole lot of fun. And then we let it go. It, it went into abeyance. And then it came back. Daniel at Guilty Feet revived Has Steve Read It for season two, mainly because there were a lot of booktubers who hadn't had channels. Well, they might have watched season one, but they didn't participate. So they all wanted to. A lot of people have wanted to. And the prize is eight beans. You get one bean for every book you pick that is fair, that isn't a niche pick or an intentionally obscure pick that I haven't read. And, uh, well, <laughs> we haven't had anybody who's had zero beans, uh, but we haven't had anybody who's cracked 50%. We've had a group of disreputables at one bean. We've had some people at two, some people at three, and a handful of people at four at, uh, who are currently the co-reigning you rulers of the universe. Uh, but we still have a few more episodes to go before season two is done, and who knows when there'll be a season three. And today we're doing uh, the Lindsay Reads episode. Uh, I'll leave a link to, to Lindsay's channel. She obviously was trying to curry favor with the judges or with me because her dog Fable is all over her video. And Fable is very, very cute. <laughs> uh, and wants to get in on the action. One of the, uh, the thing that I always want to tell booktubers when their dogs start acting up when they're filming is that your dog knows you are talking to someone, but it knows there's no one else around. <laughs> and that's confusing <laughs> because they haven't cracked video technology. God help us all when they do. Uh, but she launched off on eight books. We're going to see how she does. The first one she picks is The Other Side of Ethel Mertz. This is by Frank Castelluccio and Alvin Walker, and it's about Vivian Vance, whose only claim to fame, forever, will be as a sidekick to Lucille Ball on at least two different Lucille Ball shows. I think she, I mean, she was famously a Lucille Ball sidekick in I Love Lucy, but then Lucille Ball had a couple of other returns, one of which was moderately successful. I think that was uh, Life with Lucy or just... Lucy, or whatever it was, there was a second time that both actresses were older, that, that some recurring characters from the original show came back, uh, and Ethel Mertz is, uh, Vivian Vance is great as Ethel Mertz. She is, she was an old world, old style, professional Hollywood pro, so if you told her, you're going to get a steady paycheck of $50 a week, and in exchange for that steady paycheck, we want you to be a quintessential sidekick. So you've got one of the funniest actresses in the country who is the star of the show and you your job is to make her funnier and in exchange you will get a regular paycheck you're a starring bill and also because although the hatchets have been out for lucille ball since she died she was a very generous comedian and one of the side effects in addition to the paycheck and the starring billing would be that she would make you funnier it's it would be a capital mistake frank castellucci makes it several times in this book of hinting the, the idea that Vivian Vance was funny on her own. Okay, let's just put let's put that to rest right away. But, as you can tell from these comments, I have read this book. I absolutely love the show I Love Lucy. And not just because George Reeves made an appearance as Superman. <laughs> I loved it anyway before that. Uh, so that's a yes. So we're off to a rocky start. Uh, the next book is a little bit of a technicality. A few of you started to get up, started to rack up totals with another technicality, which is Canlit. Uh, which I admit I don't know as well as American literature. Uh, and this is another slight technicality. I'm not calling it Dirty Pool. It's not a, it's not a bad choice. It's Tricky 22 by Janet Ivanovich. And Janet Ivanovich write, has written this, this series about this one bounty hunter for 30 years. She, is, she has just gone back to this well over and over and over again. And I think Lindsay Reads was making a calculated gamble that although I had read some of these books, and she's right about that, I have also reviewed one of them, and that was no easy thing, believe you me. I think I came in at, I think I reviewed like number 10, specifically because an editor asked me to. 
Try doing that someday, or rather don't. Try doing an entertaining review of the 10th book in a series without at, without spoiling anything, but while explaining everything. <laughs> Virtually impossible. Especially since these books don't have any merit. <laughs> and those of you who like this series might have gone, <laughs> but they're really poorly written. They're really poorly plotted. They're, the characters are non-existent, except for the catchphrase one-liner that they all now repeat, you know, de rigueur in every book. And I think Lindsay Reese's gamble was that although I had read some of these, I wouldn't have gone all the way to 22, and she's right. She was right. That was a good gamble. It's not an unfair pick, because I have said that many times if I like a series, I will read it all. But this is a series I didn't like, so I didn't go all the way to 22. So she gets a no. So she's up to 1B. Uh, but that's not a good crowd to be in. <laughs> so we're going to try and get that higher. Or she is, anyway. Uh, the next one is Passing Strange uh, by Ellen Clages. Uh, it's a kind of a... a a gay-themed historical science fiction fantasy, what BookTube likes to call a mashup. In fact, if I remember correctly from her video, I think I jotted it down. Yeah, Lindsay Reed says maybe he heard about it on BookTube. <laughs> I'm going to pass over that in silence because she has an adorable dog. <laughs> if I hear about these things exclusively for a brand new book from BookTube, I'm doing my job wrong. Uh, I did hear about this. I uh, Not only that, I got a copy. I think I hauled it on this channel and read it and kind of sort of liked it. Uh, there were large parts of it that were programmatic and the climax especially. I'm not, I always complain on this channel that nobody in the 21st century knows how to end a book. It just don't know how to do it. Even when science fiction and especially mystery are plot driven, they're arc driven. It, you would seem like you would need to know how to end it, but... The ending was botched, but one way or another, there were parts of it that I liked enough so that when I when I saw it on this on this uh, entry and has Steve read it season two, it made me wonder if this author has written anything else that maybe I didn't get, maybe I haven't heard about it. I'll have to go and check on that. Uh, but one way or another, it's a yes. The next one, almost a face palm. We have categories on have Steve read it, and one of them is a face palm, where you pick a book where there is a documentary proof, where it's just unbelievable that you would think that I hadn't read the book, uh, and. <sighs> I have mentioned many times, I haven't been direct about it, and I've never made a detailed video about it, so it's not a face bomb, it's borderline, but it's not. I've mentioned many times on this channel, just in passing, that a lot of the travel that I have done has been bat-related, specifically Microchiroptera, the little ones that navigate by sonar. Um, and this next book is an absolute bible to anyone who has ever fallen in love with Microchiroptera. It's Bat in My Pocket by Amanda Lawler. Uh, and it's, an, it's not only a yes, it's an enthusiastic recommend. I don't know if it's still in print. Amanda Waller is uh, a Lawler. Amanda Waller. <laughs> That's a little bit of Suicide Squad working its way in there. Amanda Lawler is a legend in the Bat community. Just a legend. Literally went the whole arc from not knowing anything about Bats and finding a wounded Bat and wanting to save its life to establishing a sanctuary, becoming the person that handles all of this stuff. And, and knows all about it. Talks, lecture circuits, everything, a million things like it. So, uh, Bat in My Pocket is wonderful. It's not, it's not treacly, it's not overly autobiographical, it's not overly scientific, it's just a wonderful example of this little subgenre where a human makes their life with a wild animal. Uh, whether it's a lion in Born Free, or whether it's a, a thing that weighs as much as a quarter in your pocket. One way or another, a strong recommend, and wonderful to hear on BookTube. When have you ever heard this book called, talked about on BookTube before? It's only on these videos that that sort of thing happens regularly. Uh, so that's a yes, and an enthusiastic yes. And then the next one is Bloodstains with Bronte by Catherine Bolger Hyde. This is also a yes. This is, they are cozy murder mysteries, and I would ordinarily shy away from that, certainly reading everything in a series. But this series is very literary. They're, every book hinges on another literary, on another canonical author, E.M. Forster or Jane Forster, or Jane Austen or the Bronte sisters, and that it's done really well. It's done really intelligently, including in, I've read, I think, four novels in this series, and in every one of them, I noticed it first in the Forster book, uh, not only is there a lot of literary background that's worked into the plot, but there are also a couple of somewhat silent Easter eggs that are given only to the people who already know everything about the author and their literary background, but that aren't explained. There's no emphasis put on them. And I just love that. As long as it doesn't, as long as it doesn't signal itself. I don't want an author to do that at the cost of making the reader know they're missing out on something. 
But hiding a reward like that for a reader who's who's read, you know, everything by the author or everything about the author or both, I'm all for that. And that happens in all of the books in the series that I read. So that uh, Bloodstains with Bronte is a yes. Uh, then we have a Little House Sampler, uh, which is bits and pieces of Little House and also letters and little little speeches or essays or whatnot. That was that it's all excerpts from Laura Ingalls Wilder, uh, with help sort of letters back and forth, prose samples from uh, what's the name again? Rose Wilder Lane, and all of that was put together by an editor named William Anderson into a, a little sampler that isn't just excerpts from the, the Little House books. It's, it's more than that. And sounds fascinating, but although I have read all the Little House books, I haven't ever read this one. Uh, because I'm not... I've read all the Little House books, and I, I think they're interesting, and I enjoy them. I don't... They didn't hit me in the sweet spot chronologically that makes a lot of you diehard fans. And if that doesn't happen, it's never going to happen, in my opinion. It's never going to... If it, if it hits you in that sweet spot... You're always going to love it. But if it misses that window, you're not going to be able to go to it older than that and like it that way. And if that is true, that's certainly true for me. So this one's a no. Uh, but it does give me a chance to recommend a book that Lindsay Reed's brought up as well, uh, which is Prairie Fires, a biography of Laura Ingalls Wilder from a few years ago that I loved, absolutely raved about. It is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it, it, I don't know that it's one of those literary biographies that will send you right back to the author's books. It didn't for me. I read, I think, one Little House book after I read it, and I had no urge to read the others. Uh, but again, that might be because I missed my sweet spot. One way or another, it is just about as perfect an example of a literary biography as you can get. And we get those regularly. We get at least a couple of those a year. We ought to be grateful for that. We just had one from Marjorie Keenan Rollins, the author of another YA classic, The Yearling. So... Uh, so it gives me a chance to recommend Prairie Fires again. Prairie Fires is, I'm sure, out in paperback. I'm sure that it'll be in your bookstore. The only thing I'm not sure about is whether or not I am blurbed on it. I went to bat for it with my editor. I made sure that I got a chance to review it. And I made sure to, to brute about that review to the right people. So people know that I reviewed it. I just, as I mentioned many times on this channel, I, publishers don't think to send me paperbacks, you know? And why would they? If... Why would you send me a free copy of a paperback if my blurb is already on the back? There's literally nothing more I can do for you. <laughs> so, so there's no exchange here anymore. You've already sent the book hoping for a review. You got one. You got a blurb. That'll help to sell the paperback. I can't do anything more for you. Why wouldn't you make me pay like ordinary folks? <laughs> so I never got a paperback. I don't know if I'm on it. But one way or another, strongly recommend the book. Uh, and that's a no. And then we move on to Getting Near Baby by Audrey Columbus seems like a YA novel, and it seems like a fairly well-regarded YA novel. Uh, I've never read it, I don't think, before this video. I'd ever heard about it. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not all that up on YA, but I have been reading it on and off for uh, a long time. <laughs> but this one I missed completely, uh, so it's a no. Uh, and then the final book was another gamble on Lizzie Reeds' part, and I'm afraid it didn't pay off. <laughs> she, she recommends here, she lists Lee's Lieutenants by Douglas Southall Freeman. Now, she knows perfectly well from watching my channel, since I'm assuming you all watch all of my videos and memorize them. Uh, she knows perfectly well that in a little free library around the corner from the High Cottage, I found volume one in this series after decades. I read the original, it's three volumes, and I read them originally and kind of sort of liked them, and I, I reread the first volume after all that time, and I thought it was spectacularly good. I don't know what kind of mood I was, actually, I do know. I do know why I didn't like the original trilogy when I read it the first time. That was because this author, in his most famous series of books, is a blatant apologist for somebody that I don't like at all. And I think I went into those books thinking, okay, now you're going to apologize for the South, for the Southern states that committed high treason, <laughs> for, for the, the Deep South, the whole swath of which should have been stripped bare of every growing tree and salted in the earth six feet deep. And <laughs> naturally, since I have raw feelings on the subject... Uh, I went into this, maybe that's why I rated these, this trilogy lower than I should have. But I found that trade paperback, uh, and I remembered seeing it on Bill Rutenberg's channel and thought, you know, you should give this another try. It's incredible. It's just incredible. And Lindsay Reeds was gambling that although I have read that trilogy, I might not have read this one volume abridgment. She held up the one volume abridgment that Douglas Althoff Freeman did and made the correct point that the one volume abridgment is effectively a different book. Uh, but she's wrong. Alas, <laughs> I did read it. I was a, there was a time when I had a lot of people asking me, can I read the one abridgment, the one volume abridgment 
will I miss out on a lot if I read this instead of reading the whole trilogy? Uh, so I felt it sort of behooved me <laughs> to read the one volume of Bridgman. And I would say, in answer to the question that's hovering over this, read the three volumes, no matter how long it takes you. Once you start into volume one, you're going to see, you're going to, you're going to think very clearly what I should have thought the first time, which is, I don't care how long this is. I don't want to read an abridgment because I don't want to miss any of this. It's it's that good. So, I mean, the one volume of abridgment, I guess, is good for, I don't know, the one volume of abridgment is the size of a cinder block. It could be good for schools, maybe libraries. But but if you're wondering yourself, is this a shortcut to the trilogy? I would say don't don't want a shortcut. The trilogy is, is uh, very, very good. Um, and that brings us to the end. And if you've been keeping score at home, you realize that uh, Lindsay Reads has three beans. She's not getting an extra bean for blatant attempted at bribery by putting her adorable dog on the video. But nevertheless, three beans is not bad. It's a, it's high average uh, of the results that we've had so far. And those results are wearing thin. There is only one more of these to go in season two. So I don't know what, when I'll get to that, but the next time I do will be the season finale of Has Steve Read It Season 2. And then we'll let things lie fallow and we'll see what happens down the road as you all triangulate on how to do better. <laughs> we'll just have to hope that the season finale cracks four. That would be great. But one way or another, uh, that is the, the Lindsay Reads episode of Has Steve Read It Season 2. And I will list uh, all the books and a link to her channel. Uh, so that you can see your adorable dog. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll see you soon. Thank you, book two.